surprised that none of you has talked mm -hmm. about what is class classically called a near-death experience. You know, people who have come back and who report astonishing things that they experienced while they were unconscious in coma. What do you make of near-death experiences? <sighs> I'm, I'm back to my prior. Sam is the expert on this. <laughs> I, got, he's actually I, think, I think Sam's the one. Come on, let's, let's let him hit this but now, I'm going to be provocative. We can't agree on everything. I mean, okay. we got to. So, <laughs> Sam, I, I've read your work, and I've read your book, and, and um, I, I encounter it more often when people are in comas. And they wake up from comas. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's old hat. People wake up from comas all the time. Death, coming back from death. Now that's, that's, that's cool. But um, <laughs> they come back to me. Most people say, I don't remember anything. In fact, amazingly, when people come back from a brain injury, right, a traumatic brain injury, not only do they not remember anything and have nothing to report. By the way, newsflash, nothing, OK? <laughs> I'm telling you what they're like. These are real people. They're back visiting me. But what's amazing is then they wake up and follow commands, and these are conversing people that are recovering in an ICU, right? And they're like being, doing stuff, right? Getting better. And they don't remember stuff for weeks, for weeks, even after they've, quote, woken up from the coma. So, but then occasionally I encounter some other people who will, and it's the minority, and they'll say, oh, yeah, oh. You know, I experienced all this kind of stuff. And I just, I think about as a neurologist, you know, when you have a blind spot in your retina, your brain fills in the blanks. You don't, if, if you have a hole in your retina that's not working, you don't walk around with like, there's a black hole you can't see, but perceptually, you don't see the hole. Your brain fills in the blanks. And I think that, I think that some of these NDEs may just be people that are recovering consciousness and, and earnestly and, and you know, uh, uh, they really mean it and they really believe it. That's their personal experience, but in a way their mind is filling in the blanks. Okay, well I have to get Sam's response here because you have written about some <laughs> cases that yeah, come to different conclusions. You've got the expert here, come on. Come on. <laughs> You're very so. kind. I have to tell you, I have a bone to pick with you, actually, because now I, you told us just before this event that you have a whole session on near-death experiences, and you probably want me to summarize everything in like uh, 10 seconds or something. Yeah, that's it not sounds fair. like being on TV or something. Yeah, that's Five not seconds fair. tell us about the world. <laughs> I want to explain this, because as you pointed out, I mean, this is an area that I'm very interested in, and this is actually what got me into cardiac arrest work, was when I was a student and I had a patient who I got to know very well, who essentially died in front of me. Uh, they tried to save him, and they couldn't, and I was left Answering, asking this question as to well, what's happening to this person as he's going through this, as he's flatlined, as they're all sort of, you know, standing away and saying that's the end. Is he able to hear us? Is he able to see us? What happened to his consciousness? And just to sort of take a slight bit of revenge on you for not inviting me for that session, I'm just <laughs> You can so come back. You can, you can the, be in the audience. One of the this, best, yeah. by the way, <laughs> two sessions for December, we're going to be talking about near-death experiences. Right. I will come back. But one of the best <laughs> things, one of the best things I ever heard come someone say was dead. <laughs> what you said once. So I was watch, listening to one of your podcasts. Uh, I think it was actually a, a session that was done here a year or two ago. And you said that when you go home at night, you have this fascination with consciousness, and you pick up books while your wife is reading like the latest novel on whatever. You pick up a book on consciousness, and it's this big, and you find it fascinating, and you read it to the end, and that's how one you of are. those was your books, by the way. Oh, really good. Yeah. So, I'm the same. I'm a physician, but I'm also fascinated with consciousness, which is what is it that makes us into who we are, and one of the big big questions we have right now in science and for the for this century really is how. How do brain processes possibly lead to this thinking conscious being that makes us into who we are? And the general theory out there, of course, has not been proven, is that somehow brain cell processes somehow generate the mind, generate thoughts, generate who we are. But of course, there's no theory or even a plausible biological mechanism to account for how cells could even generate a single thought. So now, take that and bring it to the subject of what happens when we die. Well, <clears throat> after you know, CPR was first discovered. Um, about 15 years after that, a book was published which chronicled the experiences that people have had when they've been close to death or when their hearts had stopped. And essentially, these people all described feeling peaceful. They had a universal experience of feeling immense peace, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light that draws them towards it, seeing a tunnel, 
seeing deceased relatives, sometimes welcoming them, sometimes describing seeing a being that was full of love and compassion that would take them through essentially an educational experience where they, where they relived everything that they had done and they had said. And they judge themselves with this being's help. And often they describe going to a beautiful place. And at some point, they realize they had to come back. And a small proportion of them also describe watching doctors and nurses working on them. And that's the classical near-death experience. Now, the explanations that were put forward in the 70s and 80s were that this is probably just simply lack of oxygen, a change in carbon dioxide level. And I think those are now antiquated with what we understand. So all we can say, essentially, is that, and, and the reason someone like me is interested in this is, in order for us to save a person and bring them back, we have to understand what happens to the brain, to the cells, after a person has technically died. But we can never forget there's a person there. So what does happen to their consciousness? And the evidence we have so far, and it's an emerging field, is that when a person has technically died, their brain flatlines, um, and no human experience should be happening at that time whatsoever. Paradoxically, 10 to 20% of people do come back and they report these incredible experiences. How do we know that they're not recalling these experiences as they're coming back to consciousness, as they're coming out of the coma? Well, that's a very good question. And that's been part of what I've been trying to study. And I will be releasing the results of our study uh, in a month or so at a conference that, uh, at the American Heart Association conference. But there are cases which don't support that, including uh, what we found in our research, where essentially, you can time the person's experience. You can see they will tell you exactly what was happening to them 15 or 20 minutes into their cardiac arrest rather than just the beginning or just the end where the brain function was coming back online again. So, Wait, I just want to follow up on this. You're saying they're reporting what that happened 15 or 20 minutes ago? They're reporting conversations that were heard? Or they what? describe, so if you, a proportion of people will describe in incredible detail conversations, events that were happening, clothing, everything that happened except that, as far as we can tell, their brain at that time should be flatlined, and at best it's very, very disorganized. Yet, they come back, it's not just a subjective experience of I saw a tunnel, I saw a light. They will say that, well, Dr. Mayer came in here, and he was wearing a navy suit with uh, a tie that was sort of brown and it had stripes on it, and he said, my god, this guy doesn't look very good, let's call his wife. And then my <laughs> wife was crying. <laughs> And in all this time, someone's doing this yeah. and someone's doing that. You know. By the so, way, so no resuscitation is ever going to be caught dead wearing a tie, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, now, are, are, you, messed up. are you now talking about what are classically called out-of-body experiences? I mean, people, you know, the, 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 I don't know what, the, the entity hovering at the top of the ceiling, looking you, down at the operating table? You should table? have invited me, I told you, Steve. <laughs> so, okay, so I, I hate that term, near-death experience, and out-of-body experiences. And I'll tell you why. Because there are labels that have been put forward since the 70s, which basically polarizes people into the religious people and the non-religious scientific people. And the fact is, we're dealing with a human experience in the same way that 50 years ago, if you said that we could study love, through science, they think it's non-scientific. But actually, we can. So the people that we study are not near death. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't like to call their experiences out-of-body experiences. They are people who have gone through death, as far as we understand it technically. And they have a unique experience. And part of that is having a sensation of seeing themselves and watching and hearing things. So they have consciousness present when consciousness should not be present, as far as our science tells us today. The obvious conclusion that what we draw from this is that some, there's some aspect of the mind of consciousness that is not associated with a corresponding brain state. Well, like I said, I mean, this is very much a subject that's early uh, and just being studied. There haven't been many studies, but we have to be open to it. It's possible, like I said, there is enough anecdotal evidence and there are enough cases that have occurred that mm -hmm. suggest that consciousness may continue when brain function has ceased. And, and to answer a point that Stefan raised, which I think is very important, yes, when you interview them afterwards, most of them don't recall anything. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is simply because their brain was severely traumatized. They were given lots of sedative drugs. And all of those together wipe out their memory circuits. It's similar to the fact that we all have a dream. But if you were to ask us the following day, we don't recall the dream. It doesn't, we didn't have it. The evidence that I've seen from patients that we've studied is that actually many more of them probably have the experience, but with time they forget it. So if you don't interview them at the appropriate time, they won't recall it in the same way that people forget their dreams. So it's a completely new area, 
that's really come about, it's the flip side of the coin. One side is to save the brain, the other side is also we're beginning to study what happens to consciousness. Lance, I want to bring you in here. What do, what do you make of these near-death experiences? I, I think that Sam really sort of uh, has, has this right, which is I think we have to be open to it. And I think that we have to try to understand it because there, there's certainly data that is coming to us that, that right now we just can't really adequately explain is, is what I think That's most of true. us, what most of us think. Like I just, I just don't have a really good explanation for it. I think we have to be just dead honest with ourselves and say we don't have a good explanation for this. And because it's so intrinsically surrounding this very uh, uh, important event, um, I, I think we're at a point where we need to learn more about it and, and need to sort of delve into it. And so, um, but that's interesting. I mean, know, what you are on. saying though is you're not you're not willing to say, oh, this is clearly just the result of some biochemical hallucination. You are open to the possibility something more might be going on. I am open to anything that we can sort of begin to understand about it, and it you know, and it might include things about firing of neural receptors, and it and and it may have to do with other things that are really outside of what we understand right now. So whether you want to call it quantum sort of interactions on some level, you know, like I've never seen an electron. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't prevent me from sort of believing that, that it might exist. I think in, in a similar way, we need to be open to sort of trying to understand what, what is this. And, and I'm a very practical sort of clinician fundamentally. It's like, well, so what, what are the important things that I need to know to help a patient manage it, help a family management, to, to bring, to sense peace to people about it? I, I think that we have a responsibility to sort of learn more about that. Stefan, from what you were saying earlier, I got the sense that maybe you are the, the resident skeptic on the panel here, but is that true? I, w w what do you think? Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about how to put all this together, and um, and I'm going to make a guess about what Sam's been talking about. I, I think, for instance, we've got people in our ICU, and they can, they can become pulseless, and we run EEG on them all, right? So we've got. So I already, I can already tell you that one minute, sixty seconds after, right, when we're getting ready to start the chest compressions, you still got some brain waves. Right, and we know that there's a point in time, as as the blood pressure remains very low, that the EEG quickly kind of slows down, right? And the, we would think conventionally, well, then okay, I guess all the electrical activity of the brain is stopped. Uh, it's all about electricity with our brain. But what we've started to learn is in some of our coma patients. Um, we now put little wires down into the brain that can measure electrical activity deep in the brain. These are probes. They're called EG depth electrodes that we send down along with pressure monitors and oxygen monitors and mo measures of physiology. Well, we've already seen cases where with the conventional EEG on the surface, it's flat. But then when you have the little depth EEG, guess what? Brain's still working. It's just turned off the cortical mantle, but the subcortical structures are still working. So there may be a, I guess what I'm saying is there may be a, a pretty simple or easy to understand, non-mystical, physiologic explanation for why people can grab and retain memories and remember that I'm a bad dresser during a, a 20 like minute CPR <laughs> <laughs> if they get resuscitated. There actually may be a physiologic basis for that. And I think as, as, as physicians and scientists, that's what we're going to look first. And I guess wherever our levels of understanding end, we're getting more and more understanding, but there's, we're never going to understand it all. And then that's that beyond that boundary, that's where we got to kind of fill in the blanks. And we're dealing with something that's still unknowable.